New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos. You can now download a free PDF copy or purchase a beautiful printed edition of Issue 5 of the New Thinking Aloud magazine. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the Leading Edge of Knowledge and Discovery with Psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring the merits of a vegan diet, and I'm very happy to be in my studio in Albuquerque with Gina Carr. Gina is a speaker and workshop leader. She is the fiance of a former guest on New Thinking Aloud, Terry Brock. They've both been on the vegan diet for over nine years. Gina is also the co founder of an interesting community called Stark Raving Entrepreneurs. And uh, her business life uh, involves working with people in the business community, business leaders all over the world, helping them be up to date on technology and in their business planning. But today we're going to talk about a subject which is very personal and dear to Gina, the vegan or vegan diet. Welcome, Gina. Well, thank you so much. Delighted to be here to talk about this important topic. I'm delighted to uh, talk about it as well. As I mentioned to you earlier, we have a previous interview, only one other on this channel about the vegan diet with a, a graduate student from the United Kingdom who is studying whether or not the vegan diet facilitates ESP. And uh, he's planning to do experiments on that uh, topic as well. But as you explained it to me, there are two primary reasons for considering the vegan diet. One is ethical, and the other is for health benefits. Yes, those are the two main concerns, but there's also a third that's important to, that's important to a lot of people, and that's uh, for the environment. It actually is much better for the environment uh, for people eating a vegan diet. Let's talk about your life before you started the vegan diet. What was that like? Well, it was very much like the normal American experience, as they call it, the SAD, the standard American diet, the SAD diet. They call it SAD for a reason. And um, moderate, a, a lot of uh, dead animals, as I call them now, but a lot of animal foods. I thought I was doing what was healthy, chicken and fish, uh, not a lot of beef, but some beef, um, some vegetables, not as much. I was I was definitely more of an Atkins-oriented, uh, uh, based this diet. High protein. High protein, absolutely. And uh, and with that, I did have, I struggled with my weight most of my adult life. And uh, I was uh, 50 pounds heavier and I was constantly having a big battle with my weight. And so while I'm not skinny now, I'm I'm in the normal range for, for BMI and, and I have been able to do that without counting calories, without counting all these things that people stress about all the time. Mm -hmm. I, I just eat naturally and normally, and um, it's really worked beautifully for me. BMI is a body, body mass, mass index. index, yes. Can you explain that? That's one of the guidelines that people use to determine whether you are in uh, underweight, normal, overweight, obese category. Mm -hmm. And sadly, much of the United States population is very much in the overweight and significant numbers in the obese category, which that's leading to a lot of health problems, which... It's always struck me as a, a serious imbalance on the whole planet where you have a, some portion, usually uh, the, the Americans, uh, Western Europe, where people uh, tend to be obese. I think there's an epidemic of obesity going on. And then you have other parts of the world which are habitually malnourished. Yeah, it is really uh, interesting. and. A lot of it's education. A lot of it's just what we're raised thinking is necessary and normal and the way that things should be done. 
And uh, a lot of that does include eating animal foods. And certainly in the United States and a lot of the Western world, a lot of processed foods. Mm -hmm. And there's certainly a lot of evidence that the processed foods and the animal foods are leading to a lot of of obesity. I mean, one of the things that struck me as I was investigating and thinking about, well, are we really herbivores or are we really omnivores or carnivores? And what are the things about the human anatomy that would lead me to believe one way or the other? And I, I started looking at foods and wanting to increase my fiber intake and think and realizing that animal foods have no fiber. So fiber goes through the body. And in many of the parts of the world where people don't get cancer or diabetes or heart disease and such, uh, their fiber intake is high, their animal in, animal intake is low, and the the fiber and the foods go through the body versus the animal foods just kind of go into the body, which that visual for me was always very compelling and um, profound. Well, as I recall, you explained initially before you began the vegan diet nine years ago, you, you had toyed with the idea, but you were afraid it wasn't a healthy diet. Yes, I, I, I've been a, a big animal ever since I was a little little girl. I loved dogs, cats, puppies, kittens, horses, everything. And I always wanted to be vegan, and I thought it's not healthy. And I, was definitely, I definitely bought into the little bit of research that I had done and the doctors I had talked to that it said, no, it's not healthy. Don't, don't do that. Mm-hmm. And so I really didn't, um, didn't pursue it. But in, uh, 2014, 2014, so number of 10 years ago, basically, I was really at an upper limit. I was 50 pounds heavier. I was, I hadn't been diagnosed with any, uh, chronic diseases, but I knew I was on that path. And I thought, I've got to do something about about my health. And so I discovered a book called, and a movie called Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead. And so that person had gone on a 90-day juice feast. Juice, I call it juice feast. Some people call it juice fast. Yeah. Of nothing but plants and vegetables in a juice, juiced form. And so I did that for 30 days. Mm-hmm. And after 30 days, I had lost 20 pounds. I felt great. My skin looked great. I had high energy. I really had never felt better in my adult adult life. Mm -hmm. And and so that put me on the path of investigating seriously. Well, if 30 days of eating just fruits and vegetables is this, I have this positive benefits, maybe I could just eat fruits and vegetables all the time, Mm -hmm. which led me to research mainly um, compiled by a, a doctor called Dr. Michael Greger. And he had written a book called How Not to Die. Mm -hmm. And it's how to reduce or eliminate the 15 leading causes of death in the United States. Many cancers, heart disease, Alzheimer's, um, these conditions that lead to to death. Largely chronic diseases, I think. Yes, chronic and debilitating, deadly diseases, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And one feeds on the other. I didn't understand that correlation either, that... Uh, yes, a lot of times heart disease uh, is it, it, related to cancer, is related to Alzheimer's, or is related to everything in the body is related, believe it or not. <laughs> I know it seems very logical now, <laughs> but it didn't at the time. And and before that, I, I, yes, I was very much a carnivore. I, mm-hmm. I loved the taste of meat, but which now I I, I don't, obviously. And I, I'm, But I am excited about all the different mm-hmm. clean meat alternatives that are coming about and different ways that people who are not vegan, might be more accepting of a plant-based lifestyle or a, a vegan lifestyle where no animals are harmed and uh, because they're able to get the tastes that are comfortable for them, that are that they grew up with, that feel like that's what they, they want and desire. Let's talk about the distinction between a vegan diet and a vegetarian diet. Okay. The basic distinction is vegan is someone who is working to do no harm. Uh, and it's not, it goes way beyond diet. It's also related to clothing and, um, lifestyle practices, uh, other, other lifestyle so you choices. You wouldn't want to wear leather. Correct. Mm-hmm. Correct. Uh, I wouldn't want to wear something that was put together with glue that was made from animals. So, right. so fortunately, there are a lot of innovations in technology that are making products that look and work like leather that are not not leather. They didn't cause harm to any animal. So that's on the vegan side. 
So vegetarian, typically vegetarians will either eat um, eggs or dairy. Yeah. So dairy meaning um, milk-based products from from animals, from mm -hmm. cows, from goats, and that's and mm -hmm. such. So you don't eat yogurt. I I do eat yogurt. They make great plant-based yogurts nowadays. <laughs> Absolutely. Really? Yes. Like with with uh, soy is a very common ingredient mm -hmm. for yogurt. Yeah. And um, let's see what else. Coconut milk-based yogurt, maybe. Oh, I don't eat yogurt a lot uh -huh. because it's still a processed food. So one of the philosophies that the doctors that I follow teach is if it came from a plant, don't eat it. If it is a plant, eat it. So yogurt if it came from an animal. No, this is more on the processed processed food. Processed food. This is on the processed food side. So if it came from a plant, yeah. like uh, you know, assembly lines and manufacturing oh, and all that, that kind of, of plant. plant. <laughs> now, I see where you're going. Yeah, that was that was a bit confusing. So if it came from a plant, don't eat it. But if it is a plant, eat it. So if it's in a bag or a box or a can, that's generally not as good as a whole food. Yeah. Well, I used to be very concerned with reading labels. Well, nowadays the label is, well, it's a grape, it's an avocado, it's an orange, it's a, it's a bean, it's a food that I can see what it is. I, I don't really need the label. I once talked to a friend who was vegan. He looked very healthy. And I said, well, where do you get your protein from? And he said, well, tofu. And, and then I began reading all these stories about how tofu and soy products, I, I think they're not healthy for some reason, obscure. It may be having to do with estrogen. I'm not even sure. So I was hesitant. I began thinking, maybe you never know. It's like there's all the, this news coming at you. The things that were ideal to, to eat the, a year or two ago now are not good, or things that were supposedly bad for you a few years ago are now good. And it began to feel like I couldn't quite trust what to do. Well, this is where we have to follow the money because a lot of times it's the marketing, it's the business. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot more money in big bacon than there is in big broccoli. <laughs> so, yeah, so follow the money. Who's telling you and who's funding all of this? And what are the ads that are in the media and that are promoting to you what's good and what's healthy and what's not. So uh, let's unpack a few things there. Number one, I'm not a doctor, so I can't tell you if soy is good for you or not, but I know that soy has been made out to be a demon, especially in the United States. And this goes back to, I think it was in the 60s or 70s when soy products were starting to be really big in the United States and the animal-based food community got together and really put out some strong marketing that soy is unhealthy and squashed that. But in many areas of the world, people eat a lot of soy. In, in significant parts of Asia, soy is the mainstay of their diets. And there are areas of the world called the blue zones, where there's five areas of the world where, where people regularly live into their hundreds in good health without Alzheimer's, without cancer, without heart disease, without diabetes, without many of these chronic deadly conditions. And with that, they eat a significant amount of soy. Okinawa is specifically one of the blue zones. And they, every meal, every day, they consume a significant amount of soy. So I, I think soy is much healthier than most people think. I know the meat packing industry is very big in the United States. I think they sued Oprah Winfrey when she made some comments about uh, meat leading to heart disease. She had to go through uh, a very serious libel case over that. Yeah, it's a very it's a very significant um, moneymaker in in the United States and throughout the world. And I often think about how doctors used to recommend you smoke cigarettes. Yeah, that was considered standard. That was considered healthy. Good for your health. Good for your health. Yeah. Absolutely, a doctor would be sitting in the waiting in, in your room. Uh, and there were all there are all these ads about. You know, nine out of 10 doctors recommend this brand of cigarettes. Well, of course, today that's an app, but we, yeah. we would think that, well, that, that just couldn't be, but it's true. And just do, you know, if your viewers would do a Google search and look at the old ads, they would see that. So 
a lot of doctors don't take nutrition classes in in the medical um, field. Right. Uh, it's very much not a prevention based focus for the American and Western medical systems. Mm-hmm. It's very much a diagnose and prescribe system because that's again where the money is. Yeah. The money's in big pharma. The money's in the advertising. The money's in the the uh, processed foods and the animal foods. When you are a well-educated person, you have a degree in engineering, a degree in business. I'm sure you looked at the research carefully when you made this decision to change your diet. I did. And this book uh, by Dr. Michael Greger, his uh, website's nutritionfacts.com. Uh, he wrote a book called How Not to Die. And in there, the, the book is quite a thick book. And the first uh, chapters break down, okay, say how not to die of breast cancer, how not to die of um, diabetes and, and these different 15 conditions. But the last part of the book is all of the research. Mm-hmm. And so over a hundred thousand research papers about nutrition, about food are published every year in the United States. And, and so he has a team of people. It's not just him saying, Oh, I, I read this research because there's too much research for a single person to, to process. Now maybe, now maybe with AI, we can do some processing faster, but he has a whole team of paid and volunteer researchers that go through all of these studies. What is the potential conflict of interest? Well, what, was this a valid study? Was it not? And so when you go through all of that, his focus is very much evidence based living, evidence based diet. Mm-hmm. And that's where he comes back time and time again to whole foods, plant based diet. Is the healthiest for humans, mm-hmm. and certainly it's good. It's better for the non-human animals. And and I was showing with you earlier, uh, pre pre recording as well that I'm very concerned for the human animals. Uh, a vegan diet is very good for humans because of these health issues. It mm-hmm. just bothers me when it, it disturbs me greatly when I open my Facebook feed and I see someone talking about they've been diagnosed or someone died of a heart disease or they've been diagnosed of cancer or they've now been diagnosed with diabetes or something. And and so many of these are preventable and reversible. No. If someone has the right lifestyle, which at the top of that list of the lifestyle factors, in my opinion, again, I'm not a medical doctor, but is a whole food plant-based diet. Now, this particular doctor, what was his name again? Dr. Michael Greger. Michael Greger. Is is he himself advocating a vegan diet? He's advocating a whole food plant-based diet. Which is a little different. Well, that's where we go to vegan. You can eat a vegan diet that's very unhealthy. You can eat Oreos and potato chips and many foods that don't involve harming animals that are technically vegan. So that's where the doctors I follow distinguish between a whole food plant-based diet. So it is it is vegan, but it's not processed, unhealthy vegan. It's healthy vegan foods. Mm-hmm. Make sense? Okay. That's, that's an important distinction. Now, then there's the ethical issue, which appeals to me a lot. I was a vegetarian for a while. For for ethical reasons, it didn't work out too well because other members of my family were not, and <laughs> we struggled over that. But uh, you pointed out how good it feels to be eating a diet which is consistent with your ethical values. Yes, it is. Uh, this is something, again, going back to my childhood of realizing, oh, I love my little doggy. And if I went to a petting zoo, I love these little pigs. And then going home and eating bacon or eating a hamburger or something like that and thinking, wait, it must be a different kind of pig that gets killed, that gets raised and killed than the pigs that I was interacting with. And then to learn that in places like uh, much of Asia, they, they eat dogs. It's common. It's their regular diet. Yeah. And I and I'm thinking, well, there must be a different kind of dog that's bred to be killed. And realizing, no, that's just not the case. They are the same loving, cuddly, wonderful animals that were in my home and in my arms. It's just the attitude was that it's okay to raise them, treat them horribly, as it's done to the pigs and cows and other uh, and chickens in 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 Western world in the United States. Um, 
over there because that's what's normal. I do know that there are people who raise animals for meat and try to do it ethically. There was a big movie about a woman named Temple Grandin who was an artistic woman, but who worked very hard to help uh, breeders of cattle to uh, be humane in, in their treatment of the cattle. Nevertheless, there being their only purpose for existing at all is to be used for food. Yes, and to that, I would say a, cu a couple things. Number one, there's not enough land to raise all these animals that the humans are requesting currently ethically. That's better than the, than the um, concentrated animal, the CAPO, the concentrated farm animal operations that they have now where they're treated horribly and um, it's very inhumane. And in fact, uh, you know, there's a lot of torture and pain that goes on. Um, and then as well, if in Auschwitz, the people that were there in a concentration camp were treated really well every day, but then one day their number's up and they're going to go to the, go to the, the showers, the, the death showers, would that, would that have been okay? Especially if you had to eat them. I, I'm concerned about the hormones that enter into the body or get energized in, in the body of an animal who is about to be sacrificed. Uh, if the animal is experiencing fear uh, and those, the hormones associated with that remain in the meat when it's eaten, then the, the people are consuming whatever was. Uh, uh, part of the emotional state of the animal at the moment it was sacrificed. That, that seems to me to be one issue. And, and another issue is the cost of, of raising an animal as a, uh, compared to the cost of raising crops. Yes, I, uh, I totally agree. So, so the cost of raising crops, uh, people will say, well, it costs a lot more to raise all these crops. But actually what happens right now is we have to raise a ton of crops. I don't know the exact number, and it depends. It's based on the species. But we have to raise all these crops to feed the cow. It's not going to feed that many people. Whereas if we just fed them the crops to begin with, uh, there would have been a lot less land that was disturbed for creating the crops. Because it takes a lot of crops to feed the cows. That, that we consume. And, and just think about it, all those crops that feed a single cow that only feeds just a very few people. So that's that's a huge cost in terms of the environmental factors, in terms of actually uh, money factors. And so in the vegan community, we say, well, just skip the middle cow, skip the middle fish. You don't need the processor of the food. Go straight to the source, go straight to the plants. And, and probably even a bigger issue, though, are the pesticides, the plastics, the uh, innumerable different chemicals that enter into the bodies of, well, it can happen to plants as well. But I gather from our earlier conversation that fish and uh, farm animals tend to have a higher proportion of dangerous chemicals in their body. Well, that's uh, based on the research that I have uh, consumed. That is definitely what I believe. Mm -hmm. and. I was really surprised to learn that a significant part of food poisoning of Americans comes from seafood. Mm -hmm. So you think seafood's healthy. Well, anytime you hear someone who said they had food poisoning, ask them, when's the last time you had seafood? And uh, there's a, just a high correlation there because the seafood is so contaminated. And a lot of the seafood that people consume, even though they, it may say that it's not farm-raised, the farm-raised seafood is... Um, it's horrible conditions. Again, it's very horrible conditions uh, for the animals, for the fish, and then also very toxic and very nasty. And uh, I, I'm so glad that I'm not being presented with that anymore. So I, I do believe that it's much healthier just to eat the plants. Yeah. People talk a lot these days about a paleo diet. I, I'm not 100% sure what a paleo diet is. But I gather it's certainly true that our ancient ancestors, the most ancient ancestors, hominids and uh, early modern humans, were carnivores. Let's think about that. Civilization sprang up in the equator, 
right? Right along the equator line. There was abundant food, uh, fruits, vegetables, just growing wild. Mm -hmm. Now, based on the research I've done, it appears that as people started venturing out of those zones, uh, you know, someone's venturing out of those zones where it was warm, they don't know that it's going to be really cold yeah. in these northern climates where they go or in the far so southern climates where they go at certain times of the year. And so they get there and they realize, well, we don't have the same fruits and vegetables and, and food sources. Right. We don't have the same food sources that we had in the other areas. So they were desperate. Yeah. What, what could they do? Can we eat this, um, whatever they found, uh, this deer, this wild deer that they mm -hmm. found? Or Can whale. They, or whale, yes. Uh, or, or other types of, of sustenance. Mm -hmm. So there were desperate times. Yeah. Now, was that, does that mean that was the norm? That that's what we should have been eating? Mm -hmm. No, but it's what sustained them so that they could live until times, uh, until the, the fruits and berries and such came back out. Well, in any case, uh, modern humans and uh, Western civilization no longer need to eat meat. Exactly. So we, when we can get the healthy fruits and vegetables and healthy foods that we need and all the protein that we need, I mean, that's my line, or that's my, um, when someone asks me, well, where do you get your protein? I have researched it. All food has protein. Mm. All food has protein, I said. Does a banana have protein? Yes. Does the watermelon have protein? Yes. All food has protein, some level of protein. Mm. And when I first went vegan, I was concerned about it. And so I would monitor it and I would be concerned about it. And I would add extra protein powder and that sort of thing. And if that's what someone needs to make the switch, then do that. But over time, I have learned and realized that it it really doesn't matter. My my blood work is great. My doctor's so um uh, proud of me. She's sharing with her colleagues how, how good my blood work is. And she said, in fact, I've seen her now for two years. She said, I have inspired her to go vegan. And so, uh, she, I have the best blood work of all of her patients. <laughs> well, let's talk about the transition. Now, I'm currently not on even a vegetarian diet. What, what would it be like for me to transition to a vegan diet? Well, I think it's really, it's actually very easy because it's really only just a few foods that would count as non-vegan. So, um, one way to do it, and I, and I have advised a lot of people over the years or inspired them is, uh, let's just say week one that you cut out any beef, any cow products. Mm -hmm. Week two, cut out any pork products. Anything else, just no pork products. Week three, let's say you, uh, add, and you're adding, this is cumulative. Try to go the whole week without any, eating any chickens, any dead chickens. Uh, the next week, uh, without any fish. And so at this point, you still have eggs and dairy, if that's what you want to consume. And then the next, the next week, uh, let's say cut out eggs. And then the next week, cut out dairy. Mm -hmm. Now there are great plant based substitutes, alternatives for any of those. Mm -hmm. And again, in the early days, of mine, I've been vegan now nine years. There weren't that many substitutes, but there were some. And but nowadays, you can get delicious ground beef, um, meatballs, plant-based meatballs, plant-based chicken. But there, in most uh, grocery stores, there are sections of plant-based meats, and you can use those as your transition. Is it as healthy as as not consuming uh, the plant the plant-based meats? No. Your goal is to go whole food plant-based meats. Yeah. So if you think about it in terms of red light, green light, uh, red light, yellow light, green light foods, the whole food plant-based is the green light. Go, eat as much as you want. Mm -hmm. Yellow foods would be more processed and red foods would be highly processed. So Oreos and potato chips, highly processed. The plant-based meats are in the yellow to reddish category because they are highly processed. I have tried them at restaurants. Uh... Like, uh, in fact, where we were in from recently, the uh, Thai vegan restaurant where they have a wide variety of soy based products that simulate meats. And frankly, I've never been fond of them. Well, I, you, one of your points earlier was that um, your friend ate a lot of tofu. Now, I've eaten tofu, I ate tofu last night in that, mm -hmm. but generally I get those foods without the tofu even. It's not that I think it's tofu is unhealthy, 
but it is highly more highly processed than just the straight fruits and vegetables. Uh, so I don't I don't eat much tofu. You don't feel the need to make a, a, a special point of ensuring that you're getting protein. Exactly. And there's a great book. There's a great resource uh, for that. And the book is called Proteinaholic. And it's by Dr. Garth Davis. Mm -hmm. Dar Dr. Garth Davis was a um, bariatric surgery. Uh, he would cut people so that and so that they and he would tell them to eat a plant based diet. Uh, no, uh, an animal based diet, more of a more of an Atkins diet. This that's the diet for people who are obese and they get the bariatric surgery. They get uh, whatever it is part of their guts removed. Yes. Something along those lines. Yeah, so they go in at 200 pounds and they come out at 130 pounds or uh -huh. something like that. I don't know exactly, but but it's a really fast way to lose a lot of weight. Yeah. And so he used to recommend to his patients, and he wrote a whole book about it, that the best diet for after you've had this bariatric surgery is to go on the, the animal-based foods. Like an Atkins diet. Yes, which is what he did. Mm -hmm. He was doing. He was gaining weight. He was getting unhealthy. He was really concerned about his own health, and he went down the path of investigating plant-based living. And so that's why his book is called Protein Holly. So many of Western, especially in the United States, our health problems are caused by way too much protein, too much animal protein. Yeah. So the research is there if someone's open-minded enough mm -hmm. to pursue it and to investigate. Well, I am under the impression that if everybody were to switch to, uh, a, how did you say, whole foods, plant-based diet, yes, that it would be a better world, not just ethically, although that's important, but I guess the what I'm trying to say is sociologically that it that it w would uh, contribute to a world in which people were more caring because we would be uh, treating each other. Uh, because we're treating the uh, environment better, because we're treating animals better, we would be treating each other better as well. But I can imagine it would require enormous economic dislocations if it were to happen suddenly. For example, for all the farmers who produce meat. That's a great example. Okay, so there's an organization called Mercy for Animals, and a big part of what they do is they teach animal-based farmers, how to convert to plant-based farmers. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, for example, chicken farmers. I'm, I live in Orlando now, but I'm from Atlanta. And uh, north, just north of Atlanta, it's heavy, heavy uh, chicken farming. And the reality is that the chicken farmers, because of such consolidation in the industry, the chicken farmers are basically slaves to the big corporations that own. And so they dictate the terms. They uh, require a lot of unhealthy conditions for the farmers as well as for the animals. And it's apparently a very bad situation, and they don't make much money. Well, farmers want to break out of that, and but they don't know how. To your point, would they just they're going to go broke? They're going to, no, make the transition. This has happened also with a lot of dairy farms. Dairy farms have converted to plant-based milk processing mm -hmm. to almond milk or oat milk or pea milk. There's a whole lot of different varieties of milks that are very good and that are much healthier and, and they don't require the, um, the terrible treatment of the cows. And, and if I can add on, yes. um, the, you made the point earlier about the hormones. Um, I, yes, when you think about that negative energy, because animals do feel fear, they know they're going into this slaughterhouse. There's a number of cases where uh, the, their, their vital signs have been measured. So their heart rate increases. The parts of their brains are measured and the fear is, um, the fear is clear that they're fearful. And their, their actions, they try to get out of the queue. They try to get out of the line going into the slaughterhouses. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when you think about that negative energy, that the dead animal, has that now is going into your body. Yeah. I, I I don't have any evidence for it, but I think it, it just can't be healthy for humans. And all these people that talk about, oh, I'm for kindness. Okay, so where does your kindness end? Well, it's just an animal. Well, it's a non-human animal. We're all animals. 
we're human animals, but they're non-human animals. Mm -hmm. So where and why does your kindness end? Does it end because they don't have communication? They can't talk to you to tell you that they're in pain or that they're scared? Well, a little baby, a two-year-old can't generally talk to you and tell you that they're they're scared. But you can tell by their actions. And e even an infant can't necessarily, wouldn't necessarily be scared, but it's not right to kill that infant either. What about vegans who have pets, like dogs and cats? tend to be carnivores naturally in, in the wild. Uh, can you feed a pet a vegan diet? Well, based on one of the vegan authorities that I follow, her name is Colleen Patrick Goudreau, and she has a podcast called Food for Thought and a ton of books about veganism. She, um, she believes, and based on her research, that it's okay to feed a dog a vegan diet that dogs can eat a vegan diet, but cats cannot. Mm. Cats are what's called an obligate carnivores. And again, going back to human anatomy, uh, we don't have the canines that can shred. We have canines, but they, they're not sh canines that can shred an animal. We don't have the claws that can shred and kill an animal, uh, but canines, uh, cats do. Mm. So cats, so that is where if you were going to have cats, mm -hmm. then you are going to have to cause harm to uh, other animals to feed your cats. There, there's no alternative. Not that I know of. That but but now that there's so many te techno technology is providing us with a ton of options for plant-based alternatives. Mm -hmm. So I, I and and clean meat. So let's talk about clean meat. We haven't gotten to that yet. Okay. Okay, so clean meat is where techno uh, with the technology they are able. There's a, there's a few different kinds. There's there's one type of meat that basically is grown like like you would grow beer, like you would create beer. It's created in um, something like that where they start with certain cells and basically the, the it's grown meat is in grown. A vat of some something like that. Yes, yeah. and then there's also the option where they take some cells, certain cells from the animal, from a living animal, and they put them into a little Petri dish and they grow it into a ribeye steak or into a chicken breast or whatever. Mm. Um, and so that's what's called clean meat. And it's the costs are going down. And so for people who absolutely want that taste of the flesh and they don't like the plant-based alternatives, then this is a way to uh, eat more ethically, causing much less harm to the animals and it's uh healthier for the human as well because there are many things that you're not subjected to from the clean meat and uh all much much better for the environment well this is all very interesting gina you've given me an education well thank you it is something i'm very passionate about and in in my business i'm mainly working with people about technology and marketing and growing their businesses uh and part of my hope is that through the work that I do and just the, um, the lifestyle that I lead and people generally are able to see that I uh, have a lot of energy and that I have a lot of compassion and that I have, um, for a 63 year old that I'm on the younger side of a 63 year old <laughs> that, that, um, well, maybe plant-based living should be considered. Maybe, maybe it's not unhealthy. Maybe I should look into that. I think, instinctively i would gravitate towards this kind of a diet even as a child i didn't like eating meat but that was what was fed to me and uh, i was a vegetarian i gave it up i'm at a point in my life now uh, where i'm willing to reconsider and uh, i should certainly have a serious talk with the family members about going on a vegan diet okay well it's so easy just Instead of where the recipe says insert chicken, insert beans. Beans and potatoes are great substitutes for any of the recipes. And so you can do almost everything else that's in that recipe. You're not even going to notice. Of course, beans can cause digestive problems for you. Again, if we look at societies no. where people live long, long, healthy lives, a lot of the blue zones eat very bean-heavy diets. Oh. So it's another one of those myths. Gina Carr, thank you so much for being with me today. And for those of you 
listening or watching, thank you for being with us because you are the reason that we are here. Book two in the New Thinking Aloud Dialogues book series is a tribute to parapsychologist Russell Targ celebrating his 90th birthday. New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos.